Okay, so the topic of today's webinar is data management plans, a how-to. And the goal of this webinar is to help you get started with your DMP and learn some practical tips. Now, what you will eventually write in your DMP depends a lot on um, the characteristics of your project and the discipline-specific practices that you will, will, will follow, but we can still give you some basic tips to get you started. Uh, my name is Lucy Hradecka, and I will be giving the presentation, and then my colleague Ante Rossi will join us for the Q&A. So first, what is a data management plan, or DMP? It is a document that you draft around the beginning of your project and you update it as the project develops and you learn more details about what you're going to do. And the data management plan describes the data that you will produce or collect or reuse and how you're going to manage it throughout its life cycle. And the DMP is also a very good opportunity to recognize the risks associated with your, with your data or your research. For example, gaps in backups or um, protection of personal data. Now, there are issues that you cannot fix without having to invent a time machine and you want to uh, avoid creating such issues. And having a data management plan also helps you have shared uh, agreement on the practices that your whole team will follow, which will avoid having these uh, too many cooks spoiling the broth of your data and creating a mess by doing uh, their own thing. And if you're here, you probably already know that a DMP is the requirement of many funding agencies and each have their own data management template. But in this webinar, we will follow the general Finnish DMP template. It's very similar and can help you prepare for an Academy of Finland DMP role. So this is the basic um, uh, outline of uh, the DMP and we will follow this in our webinar. The template is accessible at DMP Tuli and um, you can download the worksheet for this webinar at the address that my colleague Charlotte will now post in the chat. Oh, thank you, Charlotte. I can see it's there. So you can download this worksheet and it's basically the same content as the, the slides. So you can follow also in the worksheet and make notes for yourself during the webinar. The, the first topic in the DMP template is the general description of the data. And the question here in the template is already giving you uh, a lot of hints about what you can write here. So here you should uh, think about and list all the key data types that you're going to produce or collect or reuse. And if you're going to work with a lot of different types of data, it might be worth uh, organizing them in a table. It helps you visualize things and helps you avoid these like long repetitive texts, but you see everything in one look. And you should describe the origin of each data type. So what are you actually doing? Are you doing measurements with an instrument or are you conducting interviews? If you are reusing data, uh, from another source or some of your old data, you should describe where is this data coming from and what are the conditions of access and reuse. You might be, for example, reusing data from Zenodo, which is the repository that you just downloaded the worksheet from, and there might be a CC license attached to this data, so this is something that you can describe. And then file formats and the rough estimate of the size. And this can really be a very rough estimate. The point is basically to recognize whether you are going to need uh, some extra resources for storage and uh, computational capacity. If you are going to be producing, for example, terabytes, tens of terabytes of data. And uh, a good tip is to, once you've defined these key data types, and if you're working with many data types, to then refer uh, to them systematically throughout the rest of your DMP. So if you, for example, then go on to describe the legal issues or, uh, or publishing the data, then you can, you can differentiate between these different data types. 
So here's an example of a data type table from uh, the restart project. Um, and here you can see that they will ab were able to visualize what kind of data they're going to be producing and that they are going to have a reasonable data size for storage and that they might uh, have to uh, convert uh, the data from two different uh, file formats from the raw data to the analyzed data. And they might have to be careful about the quality of these conversions. So this brings us to the second part of question one. How will the consistency and quality of the data be controlled? So this can mean, for example, quality control in file conversions or digitization of data or version control. Uh, now, this will depend a lot on what kind of data you will be working with and what kind of tools you're going to be using. So, for example, if you're not uh, doing interviews, then audio transcriptions of these interviews, this is not relevant for you. So think about what do you need to keep um, a high quality of your data. And in any case, this can serve as a good tool to agree on shared practices within the team. The second question of the general DMP template covers the ethical and legal issues. And now this is a topic that we don't have the time to go into detail uh, within this webinar, but Alta University has a lot of other events that focus on these issues. For example, there will be the personal data Q&A session where we have a webinar on the legal aspects of research data in general. So you can sign up with any of those if this is relevant for your research. But one of the main, the most important uh, legal aspects of research data is considering whether you will be processing personal data. And now personal data covers a lot more than just, for example, the name or social security number of a person. So I suggest reading up more about this in the link that is will be included in the slides that you will get and is also included in the worksheet. Now, another issue to consider is whether you will need an ethical pre-review. And this, this first link will uh, bring you to a self-assessment sheet. And there is also more information about self-assessment in the the other link here uh, below, uh, but basically um, this is more important if you're working with human subjects or just animals. If you're doing strictly, uh, for example, some like measurements on materials, then you usually don't work, you, you will not need ethical pre-review. And another important issue is confidentiality. If you're working, for example, with partners in the private sector, and if, if none of these apply for you, there are some more tips in the worksheet on what you can discuss in uh, this uh, section 2.1. Now, here are a couple examples uh, from actual DMPs. Here you can see that the researchers will be working with personal data. They describe that they will uh, collect informed consent from the participants and they will follow the GDPR or the General Data Protection Regulation and that they will minimize the identifiable data to only the things that they definitely will need for their research. Uh, this other example works with uh, personal data as well as uh, animals. So here you can see again that they will be compliant with GDPR, that they will apply for ethical statements from the ethics committee, and also informed consent of participants will be ensured. And regarding the test animals, they have already sought um, pre-review from the ethics committee uh, at the University of Helsinki, which deals with test animals, and they have been approved. Now in the DMP, you don't have to copy and paste the statements of these, um, of these ethics committees. It's enough to acknowledge that you have done this or you will have to do this. Now part two of uh, section two uh, covers how you will manage the rights of the data you use, produce, and share. 
And here you can discuss, for example, the ownership of the generated data. And please note that at Alta University, if you have external funding for your project, then Alta University owns the data. This is uh, good for continuity because as people leave institutions, there is a lot of mobility in academia. So the data st stays with the project. And please note that this does not take away your authorship, even though the university owns the data. Uh, you can also describe here the conditions of reuse for the data obtained elsewhere, such as open licenses or contract, contracts with third parties and so on, and any limitations to making your data available for reuse, such as the aforementioned personal data protection or <clears throat> plans for commercial exploitation of results. And in this case, you can contact the IPR management team at uh, Alto Innovation Services if you're from Alto University or seek help from the alternative services at your own home institution. And another important thing to consider here is the risk of dual use and dual use refers to the military possible military use of your research. And Alto University has also published instructions for Alto staff and researchers. And in this section, if, if you want to, you can also use this to agree on how data collection and analysis will be credited in any uh, following publications. And there are some more details about this topic in the worksheet. Now, section three concerns uh, the documentation and metadata. And this question introduces the so-called FAIR principles which refer to the idea that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for you as well as others. And uh, this question mostly, here you can mostly cover the part of uh, metadata, which is data about data that concerns the data itself, meaning describing its structure, its content, and so on. Now, metadata can also refer to the so-called bibliographic or discovery metadata, things like the title, author, description of the data, and so on, that you would publish when you publish the data. And this is something that you can cover in section five. Section five is all about publishing and archiving your data. So to avoid overlap and explaining the same things twice, you can now here stick to the data level metadata and talk about publications in section five. This means that here you will mostly be probably focusing on the interoperable and reusable aspects of the FAIR data principles. Uh, you can here cover any metadata standards or vocabularies that you use in your discipline. And now this is very discipline specific, so it's not easy to give you any general answers what you should cover here, but there are uh, for example, ISO standards used for geographical information, if there is something that you use in your project, or uh, for example, in chemistry, there's the INCHI, uh, which is a machine-readable vocabulary that describes the, in strings um, chemical um, structures. So this kind of... Uh, Vocabularies or metadata standards is something that you can definitely describe here. And if your research is uh, such that you will also need to share the code or software associated with the data, this is also something you can discuss here. And there is also a link to a recent article about uh, how you can do this. And you can also discuss any other um, kind of documentation that will make your data reusable and understandable for others in readme files or otherwise documented. And this can be, for example, the provenance, which means the origin and the history of the data, how you have collected it, what you've done with it, and so on, and uh, how the data is organized and other, any relevant documentation for your field and your research. Here you can see uh, another example from the Restart project where uh, they have explained in their DMP how they will create these descriptive file names. So there are certain abbreviations, or we can call them tags, that describe who has uh, created the file. Uh, there is a tag for date, sample, and method. 
And in the same DMP, they have also described how they will <clears throat> structure their folders and what kind of information can be put in the readme files so that the data is understandable. Uh, section five, four is about the storage and backup during the research project. And this is quite self-explanatory. So you should describe where you're going to store your data. And at Alto University, there is a <clears throat> the, there is a link where you can see all the, the Alto IT solutions and select a suitable one for your data. Uh, you can also explain if you're going to encrypt confidential data and describe the backup solutions. So for example, if you're using uh, shared folders on Alto servers, um, you can answer that you will use um, the associated backup methods such as the snapshot feature and tape backups. And here you can also describe how you are going to share the data among project members because in a lot of projects people are from different organizations and they will still need access uh, to the shared folders. So there are multiple solutions for this and you can consult with your institution's IT services if you need more help with this. Question two of section four uh, covers uh, the access control. Um, you should assign the person responsible for controlling the access to your data, which is, is usually the PI of the project. And then you can describe the solutions you will use to avoid unauthorized access when you are sharing data. And also the solutions used for authorizing access to shared data. So any methods for uh, identity and access management that you will be using, for example, in Teams or any other solution that you will be using for sharing your data within the team. Now we are coming to section five, which is about opening, publishing, and archiving the data after the research project. So what happens to your data when the project is done, when you're basically done analyzing the data within this uh, specific uh, project and its goals. So here you can think about what part of the data can be made openly available. And this is especially important if you have public funding and your funder uh, requires you to make your data as open as possible and as close as necessary, which is the basic principle for opening your data. And also Alta University encourages staff and students to open their data when it's possible. So what, what can you publish? It's useful to publish the underlying data behind your results so that people can verify and understand your results better. And it's also beneficial to open or publish data sets with reuse potential. So anything that can gain you, get you more citations and collaboration. And the as close as necessary part means that you shouldn't and don't have to publish anything that has any legal or contractual restrictions. For example, if you have acquired data from a company, from a private sector partner, or if you have personal data that you cannot anonymize. And you don't have to publish immediately. You can obviously take your time to first publish on the basis of your own data before you open it up for other people. So how do you publish or open your data? We always recommend using a data repository or a specialized data journal such as Data in Brief, but repositories are more common. Using a uh, repository will help you comply with the FAIR principles, making your data findable, accessible, reusable, and interoperable. So a repository will assign a landing page to your data set with the descriptive or discovery metadata, which will make it findable and accessible. Usually you will get a persistent identifier such as DOI for your data set. You will be able to assign a license for reuse and uh, CC BY is recommended. And in most repositories, you will be able to attach any necessary documentation, for example, readme files 
or some discipline specific repositories will let you enter uh, standard metadata from your, from your field. If you cannot publish your data for the reasons we mentioned before, you can explain it here. And you can refer to section two where you have already identified the legal and contractual issues that might be connected to your data. But you can, if you can't publish the data sets, you can still publish only the discovery metadata, meaning uh, the title, uh, the author's description of the data and so on. And there are multiple ways to do this. If you're from Alto, you can enter the metadata into OCRIS, our research information system, where you can use the Finnish National Fair Data Services. And this is beneficial because it will still make your data sort of findable. Even if you are not sharing the data in itself, you are still making your expertise findable. And uh, this, this can attract collaboration. Question two in section five is uh, about more than just publishing. Uh, this uh, section covers more of the end of your data life cycle or what will happen to it when, when the project is over. So you can plan to categorize your data into these four categories. And obviously you will not know exactly what uh, part of the data will go into which category, but you can still make plans on how you will, you are going to appraise the data and select what you're going to keep and so on. So there is some data that might have to be deleted. For example, if, you're, if you've promised in your privacy notice that you will delete uh, any personal data after five years, for example, or if you identify data with definitely no reuse potential or some internal notes or things that are not that important uh, for the future. Then uh, the other category is uh, data that has to be kept for verification period. This could be, for example, five years. And this is, for example, if peer reviewers or someone uh, from your field needs to see the data to verify your results. And this doesn't have to be published in a repository. Such data can be stored internally. It's, however, still important that you know where it is. And um, folders can become messy and if people come and go. Uh, it's good to have a plan where this data will be kept and how you will ensure that someone from the, the project still has access to it. And the third category is data to be archived for reuse. This can be for up to 20 years or more. And for this, uh, we definitely suggest using trustworthy data repositories because once you submit to a repository, you can stop worrying about your data. It's being looked after by the repository and you don't have to keep track of in which folder it's kept and who has the access. The fourth category is not that common. Uh, data to be submitted for digital preservation is then kept for decades or even centuries and kept usable by, for example, file uh, format migration and so on. And this requires a specialized service. In Finland, we have the Fair Data Pass service. And um, this is only meant for especially significant data. And this can mean, for example, data that was very expensive to create, uh, let's say, in a, a particle collider that's a very expensive research infrastructure, and it would cost a lot to recreate the data. Or, for example, data that is historical and you would not be able to recreate it either. For example, uh, some uh, opinion polls around a certain historic event, such as an election, you can't go back in time and collect those uh, data again. So if you think you might have some data that belongs in this category, and if you're at Alta University, contact us and we can help you look into whether you can use the FAIR data Bus service. So here is an example of uh, an answer to the question 5.1 concerning uh, what part of data you can open and where and how. 
uh, these researchers selected the FAIR data EDA storage service, which is part of the National FAIR data services in Finland. And they are describing how the descriptive metadata will be published and that they will also be sharing the computer code that is, has been developed in this project and is important for the results. In this other example, the researchers have uh, not chosen a specific repository yet, but they are considering Zenodo, and they will uh, use Creative Commons licenses for uh, defining the reuse conditions. And uh, because they will be working with uh, personal data, they uh, are aware that they can only publish the anonymized non-identifiable part. They will choose a repository that will assign persistent identifiers to their data. And the, the parts that cannot be published uh, will still be described in a metadata catalog and made public. So now we're coming to the last question of the general GMP template, uh, which covers the data management responsibilities and resources needed for data management. So in question one, you uh, should define who will be responsible for all the practices that you described in the previous questions. So while the PI in a project is usually responsible for the decision-making and uh, for the conduct of the research. Uh, if you have a larger team or a, a project that uh, involves a lot of people, you can still share the responsibilities because it's not realistic that the PI should be doing everything in such project. So you can, for example, assign uh, the person responsible for training group members and going through the practices defined in the DMP with them. Uh, you can define who will be responsible for updating the DMP as the project develops and so on. And in large scale projects, you can even assign someone who will be the, the data manager or they can also be called the data management officer. And the final question is about what resources you will need. And this can mean financial resources as well as uh, work time resources. And work time is money after all. Now, most repositories are free of charge for the end users. So it's not very common to have repository submission fees. But you might have to pay for extra storage or computation capacity or there might be some laborious tasks involved in your research, such as interview transcriptions that you might even want to outsource and pay for it separately. And in any case, the time used for making your data fair, all the documentation and creating metadata and submitting to repositories also takes time. So you can also consider that in this part. And at the end of the slides, you will find some additional reading, some DMP templates of the most common funders and some policies uh, that can be relevant for you depending on uh, who funded your project and uh, more links to the Alta University website for the relevant topics. And this is all from me. And now I would like uh, to hear from you, 